I'm Carrie Collins and this is week eight of Life Renovations. This week I'm going to talk a bit about the scientific reasons for visualization and how that affects you spiritually. I'm also going to introduce you to some new stretches today and we're going to talk about what it means to have gluten sensitivities. In the hospital, doctors monitor your vital signs, your blood pressure, your temperature, your heart rate, and your respiratory rate. Our subconscious mind regulates all four of these things without our permission or rational thought unless we consciously decide to focus on changing one or the other. I can consciously change my breathing as long as I'm focused on it, but once I start focusing on something else, my breathing becomes automatic again. It doesn't just stop because I stop focusing on it. In the same way, I can regulate my heart rate and my blood pressure by consciously deciding to control my fear and stress levels. Our thoughts are also vital, but can't be measured and recorded like the signs that I just talked about. Our subconscious mind continues to think. We can consciously decide to change our thought pattern, but when we change our focus, we go back to thinking subconsciously. It's strange to think of our thoughts as vital, but when your brain stops sending signals, just like when your heart stops, you're not considered alive anymore. There are various levels of consciousness, and each corresponds with a specific speed of brain waves. We have delta, which is deep sleep, theta, deep meditation and light sleep, alpha, which is daydreaming or relaxation. Hold on, I'm going to put up, I have this written down for you. Um, alpha is your daydreaming or relaxation, beta is normal consciousness, and gamma is a sudden insight, which is actually twice the speed of our waking thoughts. There's a small level between theta and alpha where visualization happens. Daydreaming, on the other hand, only happens in the alpha state. That's at a higher brain frequency. The point being that visualization happens when the brain is quieter and more controlled than daydreaming. When we daydream, we allow our mind to wander where it wants. We can travel from like, what should I buy for dinner? To like, I was a great date. To like, imagining your wedding day in like a matter of seconds. And these ideas just like are popping everywhere. With daydreaming, there's no control. You're allowing your mind to carelessly wander with no focus. When you visualize though, you're actually going into a deeper state of mind, into the theta level of consciousness. The mind is controlled and you're focused on your goal and your brain waves are slower because of it. Some people believe that we can actually transverse into the gamma state through the theta state. Gamma waves are associated with happiness, bliss, and sudden insight. It's what's been called enlightenment. When they talk about like monks, they, in Tibet, they can like figure out their brain waves and they're all hitting like gamma waves all the time. Um, it has a lot to do with visualization and deep rest and meditation. It's the moment of being in the zone or like heightened intelligence. Some people believe that this is a state where we can access the universal mind and that we're actually having a spiritual experience. It's a little out of the realm of this course to say that this is where you receive messages from God, but it's not completely out of line either because sometimes it feels that way. When you visualize in the alpha theta state or in the theta state, you'll occasionally have these sudden bursts of insight that will help you reach your life's purpose. If you're practicing your meditations and visualizations in this course, you won't really miss a burst of gamma rays. You'll actually feel like completely mind blown, like dumbfounded at the realization you've just had. It's kind of like the first time you looked at the stars and realized that like the universe is gigantic. The wow factor is like that big. This is what athletes and musicians call being in the zone. As part of my music training, I'd focus strongly on visualizing while playing a piece of music. As long as I could hold that visualization, my fingers would just fly over the keys. The music would be so beautiful and I wouldn't make a single mistake. It, it was like it wasn't even me playing. Sometimes I'd have these like bursts of greatness that would just take me completely by surprise. When I was researching gamma rays, I realized that I was putting myself into the state on a regular basis and it felt so good. It's not just for feeling good though, while playing music or acting or whatever. Um, Albert Einstein, he's a pretty smart guy, believed that people think through images and symbols and music helped lead him to a lot of his discoveries. It wasn't uncommon for him to sit at the piano or um, playing his violin and after playing stand up and say, I've got it. And he like had figured it out and not just music, but like the law of relativity. <laughs> These sudden bursts of insight happen when the mind goes into the theta state. And that happens when we visualize. You may have had these kind of insights while you're playing music, 
doing art or even doing something where you become kind of trance like like painting a room or swimming laps in a pool. I think this is the phenomenon between runners high. The important thing to realize though is that visualization or deep meditation in the theta state is like the secret passageway to having this gamma ray experience. Once you've had this feeling, it's not hard to experience a shot of gamma rays as a spiritual experience. When we talk about a higher power, three words usually come up, omnipresence, omnipotent, and omniscient. I believe our mind, whether communicating with the higher power or not, is actually all of these things. So I wanna look at a couple definitions. Omnipresence means that you are present everywhere at the same time. Omniscient means that you have total knowledge and omnipotent means that you have unlimited authority or power. So I wanna talk a little bit about how your mind is like this. Let's, let's start with an easy one, omnipresence. This is the idea that our thoughts can be anywhere and everywhere we want them to be. So while in the physical world, I'm in my office right now giving you a webinar on a Thursday afternoon. But if I'm visualizing or if I decide to, I can take my mental world in a visualization and I can put myself in St. Pete's Beach in Florida, watching the sunset on like my favorite first date of all time. I can experience the same nervous emotions, the same anticipation, the same amount of admiration I had on the exact day. I can smell the salt from the ocean. I can feel the warm, humid air. It doesn't matter what time it is here in Chicago or what day it is in Florida. From there, my mind can jump from one memory to another in my past, just like flipping through a photo album. Each time with trained focus, I can be there just as vividly in my mind as if I was really physically there. Similarly, if you sit and visualize your favorite meal, you'll actually start salivating. Your mind is already there. So the same goes for the future. I can visualize the future and be there just as vividly if, as if it was really happening. This doesn't mean that I'm psychic or that you're psychic if you do this, but that you have the ability to test out future scenarios in your mind without actually having to physically be there. Our minds have the ability to be anywhere and everywhere at the same time. Our next step in this path towards making a spiritual discovery is realizing that your mind is omniscient, that it has total knowledge. I've said before that we only use about 10% of our brain's power. In fact, our mind is making amazing decisions right now based on information that you've never learned, like how much air you need in a given day or how fast you should breathe to make sure you get it. NASA needs a whole team of engineers to figure that out for a spaceship, and yet your body's able to figure it out and regulate so many similar things without any conscious decision making. Another one, like have you ever paid attention to your feet when you walk? You have over 200,000 nerve endings in your feet. Each one is sending a signal to the brain to keep you standing upright, even if the sidewalk raises on one side or you step on a rock. You don't just fall over. We're intelligent enough to maneuver our bodies in space. Scientists haven't been able to reproduce a robot with the same ability to gracefully move, even with all the information that's available to them. So going a step further, I believe that any information you need to fulfill your life's purpose will either find its way to you through another person or will come to you in a sudden burst of gamma ray insight. Not unlike putting in a query to an internet search engine and having all the information at your fingertips. The World Wide Web, a network of free information from all over the world, is the most physical representation of the universal mind. My cat just broke something. It's all right, that's what that noise was, if you heard it. <laughs> When you accept that your mind is part of an energetic worldwide web of information, you'll be a step closer to finding your life's purpose. So lastly, our minds are the final authority when it comes to creation. They're, um, they're the final authority, they're omnipotent. Nothing happens in your world without the permission of your mind. You decide what to eat, what to wear, who to talk to, what to look at, and what happens to you throughout the day. Omnipotence is the most challenging for people to accept because so much of what happens in day-to-day -day life feels out of your control. You have to take complete ownership of your life and accept that all the good and the bad came to you because you willed it to be so. So sickness, death, injury, and misfortune all come to you because you allow it to be. In the same way, success, health, and abundance come to you because you allow them as well. So do bad things happen to good people? Well, yeah, of course. But my point is that even good people allow bad things into their world. One example, I have a friend who's a, whose constant negativity 
culminated in cancer, two bad breakups, and a careless accident that sent him to the hospital, all within the same year. While he's tried to change to positive thought patterning, he reverts back to negativity when things don't go his way. I have trouble feeling pity for him when another bad thing happens because I know that he's opened this door for these misfortunes to come in. He could also shut the door and only allow happiness, health, and abundance into his life. Would these accidents have happened? I don't know. In his last accident, he was on his way home when he realized he forgot something and had to go back. He's like all frustrated and he's all like, just my luck. And then he walked back outside and it started raining. And he says, of course it would rain on me today. I don't have an umbrella. I never catch a break. And then he's crossing the street. The light turns to red and he starts running. He tripped and slipped and the fall ended up in a trip to the emergency room. The next day he wrote on Facebook, next year better be better because God knows it can't get any worse. I just wanted to grab him and shake him and smack him and be all like, snap out of it. He not only opened the door for each bit of these accidents to happen, but he opened himself up for more trouble in the future. When you realize that you're in charge of everything that happens in your world, you can make better decisions. For instance, my friend's mindset allowed him to forget something from the beginning. His frustration at his delay and the subsequent rain made him feel impatient enough to run across the street. Someone in control of their thoughts has the ability to decide if forgetting something could be a positive experience or a negative experience. Or like if the rain is something that you love or you hate, or even if running across the street on a busy, dark and rainy night is a really good idea. I think one of the hardest things for people to accept is when really horrific things happen like death and destruction. Death is a part of our life cycles and it happens sometimes unfairly, but it's the one thing that we can guarantee will happen to every single person on the planet at some point. The grieving process is important and anger is part of that process. So I don't want to negate that, but even during the grieving process, because your mind is omnip omnipotent, you have the ability to, to say, um, you have the final say on getting out of bed every day and moving forward with your life. Natural disasters are another one of those things that are confusing when you start to realize the omnipotence of your mind. So did you cause last night's storms, for instance? Probably not. But you have the ability with your mind to make decisions that affect your life and prepare you for these things. You know when you choose to live in southern Florida, you better have a hurricane plan. You know that when you live in the Midwest, you probably ought to have a tornado plan. And the same thing with earthquake plans in California. Through your thought processes, you have the power to accept. Sorry guys, I just lost my internet connection. Let's wait for that to come back on. All right, we had a little um, setback there, but I just wanna check in again that you guys can all hear me now. Sorry about that cutoff. Great, okay. So like I was saying, you know, you have the ability to choose where you live and what you do and how you prepare for that. So through your thought processes, you have the power to accept to ignore or to make negative the preparation and cleanup for a disaster. Good or bad, your mind really becomes the final authority. So when you come into an agreement that you're omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent through your thoughts, you'll find that everything you need to fulfill your life's purpose can and will come to you if you will it to be so. This is the law of abundance. This is a beautiful law. It's a law that states that you can have health, 
happiness, and wealth if you earnestly desire it. And understand that these three things are what these three things really are. So many of us believe that we can have happiness by accumulating material goods like a fancy car, the perfect spouse, or an exotic vacation. We believe sometimes that health can be had by working out five days a week, drinking eight glasses of water a day, and taking the right supplements. Even more so, we're convinced that getting a raise, paying off our debts, and being able to retire at 65 is wealth. When you realize that through your thoughts, you're connected to the entire universe, these methods of gathering happiness, health, and wealth pale in comparison to what you actually have access to. Abundance isn't about money or material goods. It's about believing full-heartedly that you are one with all of life. You have access to the same power in the world that allows a giant tree to grow for hundreds of years. These trees stay in one place and just pull in all the nutrients from their roots. So when you're taking your daily walks, realize that this is the same power that provides worms for the birds, acorns for the squirrels, water for the trees, sunlight for the flowers, and even snow to allow the earth to rest. It's the same power that will bring you the people, ideas, and supplies that will allow you to fulfill your life's purpose. And that is the source of happiness, health, and wealth. It's hard to get mad at the rain when you realize that it's the universe's way of providing for the things we need and love in life, like trees, flowers, rivers, lakes, and oceans. Those things bring us drinking water, bathing water, plumbing, fruit, and vegetables, and the joy that comes from boats and swimming and surfing and fishing and scuba diving, and the list goes on and on and on. Complaining about the rain is like saying you hate the ocean. When you feel negative emotions, just take a second to realize how the law of abundance is working in your life and in the lives of others and be grateful. And that's the real way to change your thoughts. So for your journaling this week, I want you to take a bird's eye view of your perfect day scenario from last week. That was a fun one to write, wasn't it? I love that exercise. And I, I want you to rewrite this experience like you're writing a newspaper story about someone else, like in the third person. So what does your life look like from the outside? What accomplishments brought you there? What great things are you doing in the world? And what is it about your life that makes it newsworthy? Imagine that your great grandchildren come across this article after you're deceased. What would you want them to know about you? Remember the things we just talked about. In this writing, you are visualizing and you have the ability to reach great insight through gamma rays. Your mind is omnipresent and you can actually take yourself in your mind to the future scenario and try out the perfect way to get there. Your mind is omniscient. You're not limited by the amount of information you can have access to. You can describe the perfect career even if you don't have the resources now. Like if you want to be a neurosurgeon and right now you deliver mail, I mean you can, you have access to all the information in the world. You can learn to be a neurosurgeon if that's what you really want. Now if you accept the idea, um, your mind is omniscient, you can know everything that you wish to know. And your mind is also omnipotent. So you have the ultimate authority on how your life plays out. So don't allow yourself to be limited by societal constraints. And lastly, tap into the law of abundance. Imagine that just like a giant oak tree has received all the nutrients it needs to grow for hundreds of years, that you're sucking up through your roots every nutrient you need to accomplish this goal. So in this exercise, when you write it out, you can see the possibility for the final outcome of your life. What is it really that you wanna be remembered for? So this is where we fine tune our life's purpose. And then in your visualization practice, we're gonna take this even a step further. So I want you to practice keeping focused by taking an object back to its origin. So for example, you can imagine like a great big giant cruise ship, this huge city of a boat and visualize all the people on the boat, the visitors, the staff, and the captain. See how the visitors prepared themselves for the trips. See how the staff stocked the boat with food in the kitchen and put all the linens on the beds in the room. See the food coming off the trucks and imagine where those trucks came from. Imagine the office workers who picked up the phone to call the farmers to order the food or called the store to buy the sheets that go on the bed. Imagine the farmer who planted the seeds and marketed his goods to the cruise line. You can imagine the creative team who brought in the design elements into the ship, like who decided what chandeliers to put in the dining room and what slot machines to put in the casino. Imagine the singers and the dancers preparing their entire lives to get a professional career, all the dance classes, the auditions, and their final excitement when they were awarded the job on the cruise ship. 
Imagine the builders who put together the ship piece by piece and floor by floor, putting in the final touches, filling the swimming pool before the first guests arrive. Imagine the steel being cut to make the ship, the sound of the blades cutting the metal and the sparks that fly when they're welded together. And then imagine the blueprints being made by the engineers and the plans by the architect. Imagine these plans being made with the architect and the financiers. Imagine someone's great idea to build a cruise ship and then going out to find investors. And keep going back. Imagine that older ships, these ones that came before our current cruise liners. Imagine the ships that brought people over to America when air travel didn't exist. Imagine the old sailboats that were used to discover new worlds. And imagine those hollowed out wooden canoes that our ancestors used. And then imagine somebody sitting on the edge of the water, looking at a floating log on the river and having discovered the law of floating objects. If you figure out what that law is then for floating objects, it's the specific gravity of any substance is the weight of whatever you put in it compared to the equal volume of water. Then you get this insightful moment. It's like, poof, right? Try recreating this visualization first, whether it's with a cruise ship or, you know, an airplane or something, um, a skyscraper, anything you can think of, but start big and trace it back to the origin. Then I want you to take the plan of your news story from your journal that you will hopefully write after this and deconstruct it to its most insightful moment. You can keep doing this all week and try to find even more detail in the deconstruction. Try to imagine everyone and everything that might possibly be connected to you getting to that point. Remember that visualization and daydreaming are two totally separate things. Keep your focus solid. Um, keeping it solid will allow you to enter the theta state. And hopefully you'll get a few shots of gamma rays too. So after your visualization practice, write down any insights that you've gained. Remember that your mind is omnipresent. That means you can try out the future in your mind. You might feel like you're making things up. You might expect it to happen exactly the way that you envisioned it, and it probably won't. But the important thing is that you're not only seeing the possibilities, but you're allowing yourself to receive that sudden insight that's gonna help you reach your goal. So for your physical challenge this week, I'm gonna add four more stretches onto your routine. I want you to continue your walks up to 20 minutes and keep doing those two series of stretches that I showed you before. Uh, but this week I want you to make a conscious effort to memorize the next four stretches, which is a new hamstring stretch, a stretch for your upper back, a stretch for your inner thighs inside the side of your body, and a stretch for your hip flexors in the front. These are great stretches. Uh, they're all done in a chair, and I think you're going to really like them. So I will send you in your packet, in your email, the, um, the sheets that you can print out of the stretches, but I'll also have a video for you as well. All right, and now moving on to our diet challenge. Two weeks ago, I asked you to do something nearly unthinkable, to cut dairy out of your diet for a week. Cutting a staple food out of your diet forces you to learn more about what other food choices you have and what you might be missing out on. This week, your challenge is to eliminate gluten from your diet. Similar to dairy, many people have sensitivities to gluten. Some are instant and severe, like in celiac disease, and some are much less obvious, like annoying bloating and gas. My agenda for you isn't to completely eliminate gluten from your diet, unless you find that that's really helpful for you, but to take this time to explore the other really great grain options that are gluten-free. Gluten is a storage protein that's found in wheat, rye, and barley. Many people in America have sensitivity to gluten and have to cut it out of their diets completely. Gluten can be found in nearly all breads, unless they're marked gluten-free, and in pasta, it's called semolina. Oats don't contain gluten, but can be cross-contaminated by wheat, so you always want to check that your, gluts, you, bleh, that your oats are also marked gluten-free. People notice um, a myriad of problems in which gluten can be the cause. Many gluten sensitivities are conditions that are unexplained or don't respond to usual treatment, like anemia, chronic fatigue syndrome, weakness, tingling in the hands, migraine headaches, and there's just a few things. Uh, the most common gluten intolerance symptoms are gastrointestinal problems like constipation, diarrhea, bloating, and gas. Um, a lot of times it's considered like irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, by testing gluten in this way, you can find out if your chronic, chronic problems improve when you cut back on gluten. Gluten sensitivity and celiacs are two different things, and gluten sensitivity does not show up in blood tests or allergy tests. So the only way to find out is to just kind of eliminate and see what happens. Celiac disease, though, requires a bit of a different routine. 
Like I told you a few weeks ago, if you have gastrointestinal issues and you think you might have celiacs, a blood test is required before you stop eating gluten. If you test positive, then your next step will most likely be a gluten-free diet, but your doctor will tell you what to do. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease in which gluten protein actually creates antibodies that destroy your intestines. Before celiac disease was widely diagnosed, many people were nearly disabled by their symptoms, missing many days of work and even having to have parts of their intestines removed. Changing the diet allows the intestines to repair and many celiac sufferers can start to have a normal life. If you don't have celiac disease, taking this week to do a gluten-free diet will help you to sympathize with your friends and family members that have this difficult disorder. I'd like you to experience this as a fun challenge, a way to explore some other alternatives in your diet. Some can be healthier than eating wheat. Remember in previous chapters that it doesn't make your body or your mind happy to eat pretend foods. So eating quinoa pasta, that it just doesn't have the same consistency as traditional semolina pasta and you won't experience it as a better option. For those who absolutely must cut out gluten, a quinoa pasta is a great option if you really miss spaghetti. But I suggest sticking to what the food was originally intended for and just experience some new recipes and new cuisines that are traditionally gluten-free. So you'll need to rethink a few things, but it's not as hard as you think, so here are some basic pointers. Um, first thing, check your cereal if you're a cereal eater for wheat, rye, barley, or oats. Choose a cereal that's made with rice or corn instead. But even a better option, just rethink breakfast altogether. Try an egg on top of sauteed spinach in the morning. Make a hot breakfast with rice, millet, or quinoa, and add a little bit of dried fruit and nuts and some cinnamon, it's really good. Um, sandwiches are kind of out completely. Gluten-free breads are not nearly as tasty as wheat-based breads. Salads are really great alternatives. You can add tortilla or rice chips if you need some carbohydrates or like black beans. Um, if you need something more substantial, create a sandwich taco with lunch meat, lettuce, some salsa and beans, and put it on corn tortillas. And so it's no coincidence that I introduced you to rice bowls last week. I want you to experience or experiment more with Asian foods. Japanese food, Chinese, Thai, Vietnamese, and Korean foods all tend to be rice-based instead of wheat-based, so it's a safe option. Soy, though, not so much. You can get um, soy-free tamari, which um, you can buy at health food stores, and that's a, like a soy sauce option that's wheat-free and gluten-free. I want you to experiment with quinoa. Quinoa is this fantastic grain-like seed from South America. It has an amazing amount of nutrients, including protein. It cooks really fast like couscous and can be made into cold salads, hot side dishes, or a base for soup, as well as like a ton of other things. I usually will make like a, a big, huge quinoa side dish in the beginning of the week and then eat it cold. I'll just leave it in my refrigerator and eat it cold all week long or put it in like some chicken broth or vegetable broth and have soup with it too. Uh, it's a really good option. There's a great recipe on my website by um, our trainer and personal chef, Estelle Harford, and uh, I suggest on the Stretch Tea website to look up that. I'll put the link in your, um, in your email as well because the recipe is really, really good. And then the last thing, um, if you, you know, the biggest thing with gluten is like it's your birthday comes along and you need cake. Like everybody wants birthday cake on their birthday. If you are not eating gluten, um, a lot of bakeries now make flourless chocolate cakes. And they don't even make them because they're catering to a gluten-free crowd, but they're making them because they're really delicious. So keep your eyes open when you're at the, at the bakery the next time, and um, think about gluten-free cakes. If you're having a party and you serve a gluten-free cake, you're ensuring that your guests who might have sensitivities won't feel left out or they won't suffer after the party. So just like with the week off dairy, at the end of the week, have a great big piece of wheat bread and take a week to notice your symptoms. You might notice that wheat is contributing to some pretty nagging physical issues in your life. When you're aware of this, you can make conscious decisions for your happiness and well-being. It's possible that a wonderful piece of birthday cake will give you a migraine, but the happiness of having that piece of cake might make it worthwhile to you. But then again, if eating bread at dinner will make you feel gassy and bloated, then you should probably skip the pasta if you're on a date. For a small percentage of you, cutting gluten out completely will be a total life change, difficult to implement. But the happiness you'll feel from feeling healthy and in control of your digestion makes it 100% worth the sacrifice. So I really, I hope you enjoy this week. It's, um, it's a good one, not only for taking care of your body, but for really learning to focus on exactly what you want your life to look like and 
deconstructing it from the future. So have a great week, everyone. Um, I will see you next Thursday at noon. I'll stay on a little bit if anybody has any questions, um, but otherwise you are free to log off now and I'll see you guys next week. And then for the rest of you, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and throw them at me. Anybody got anything? We had a small group today. Everybody must be out in the sunshine or asleep after that great hockey game last night. So how did you guys enjoy the um, writing out your perfect day? That's like my favorite. Oh, thank you, Michelle. She said she enjoyed the lecture. I am um, writing out my perfect day is like my favorite thing. And I do it on a regular basis sometimes because I just think it's it's such a great tool for um, for being really creative, you know, and really trying to think about what it is that you really want in life. So was that eye opening for you guys? Uh, Michelle said she took notes and she loves how you said take complete ownership of your life. It's it is really you know once you take that and like you realize wow I really am in charge of everything that happens. I mean people are always like well I can't control that I live in Chicago and that it snows every winter. And it's like yeah you really you do have the final authority on that. You've decided every path and every step that you've taken up to this point that leads you exactly to where you want to be. And you decide how you want to react to certain things. You react to the people around you. You, um, How you want to react to even the, the tragic things that happen in your life. You decide. And you have to take ownership of that. And not only do you have to, but that you do anyway. It's just that's your job. That's what it's Because we're omnipotent. We have the ultimate power and the ultimate authority over everything that happens to us. So it's, a, it's pretty powerful. It's a pretty powerful realization. Does anyone else have anything before we log out? Ah, uh, yeah, what about sucking up through the roots? I mean, really, it's, I spend a lot of time walking these days and I think when you put yourself in context with nature, it's kind of, um, it's really powerful to think about, especially if you walk past some of these huge trees. We have these trees in Chicago that are gigantic, or if like you've ever walked in the um, in the sequoias um, in California, or you know just seeing these these plants. They start out as like a little seed and a little plant, and they get everything they need to become this great big massive tree. And it's not like they have to like be like, oh, I can't catch a break because I can't get any nutrients like that. No, like the water gets sucked up. I mean, we have droughts, but eventually it rains again. And, you know, sometimes it's dark outside, but eventually it's sunny again. And then photosynthesis happens and it makes all the stuff that they need. And then, you know, like the, the trees get the carbon dioxide that they need from us every time we breathe out. And then, you know, we get to take in the oxygen that they give us back. It's, I hate to be a tree hugger and be like, the trees are so cool, but I mean, they really are. And when you think about it that way, like whenever you're feeling like life isn't quite giving you what you need or that like you're, um, you can't catch a break. Like if you just really look outside and see, like every time I see a bird that's like taking a shower in a little puddle on the ground, I'm like, you know what? That rainstorm is a good thing because that bird was probably really disgusting or like, <laughs> You know, when a bird catches a worm in the ground, I'm like, I couldn't, I don't think I could find a worm in the ground if I search for it forever. And I'm much bigger than a bird, but they seem to know where it is and they get what they need. So um, we get that too. 
And it's different because we have the ability to think and plan and do different things that animals and plants don't have that ability. So, you know, when it comes to trying to do something big and great in the world, or even something that makes you feel fantastic and helps other people, you have that ability to pull the resources that you need and people and things come to you that, um, that give you what you need. And even if it's just something as simple as like, you know, logging on to a computer and doing a search engine for, or, you know, searching for something that you didn't know about or that you want to, you need to learn for the next stage of your life. I mean, just the fact that it's all there for you is amazing to me. Just the fact that like I can access any bit of information at any given time is amazing. When this book came out, the master key system, when it came out in 19... 12 why can't i remember 1911 it um he didn't i mean you still had to go to the library and look in the encyclopedia britannica to find out what was going on in life and there was no guarantee that any of that was even up to date or you know like the the amount of information that we have at our fingertips now is amazing so um yeah you have all that and that's real abundance that's pretty cool i think All right, guys, any more questions about anything else? Anything that, um, anything cool happening in your life that you want to share? Anybody want to meet Evie? There she is. It's my crazy cat. I usually lock her up. So she broke something earlier. All right, well, if I'm not getting anything from you guys, then I'm going to log off and I will see you all next week. So take care, it's good to see you all and um, happy visualizing. <laughs>